I feel like a, a deer in a headlights once again. Um, not because I'm nervous. Um, Um, God's, um, I, I, it'll get better. Um, <laughs> I have notes. Um, he's doing something in me. I, I don't quite understand. I think he wants to do something in us that I don't quite understand. Um, God's made me a, a builder. I see chaos and put it together. Um, but I feel a bit disorientated. Yeah, I don't think we would believe it if God told us what he's going to do. Um, Taylors, thank you for being here. The whole family, Chris, Karen, Simon, Ella, remember those names. <laughs> Daniel and little Kiki, who's more than a person, she's an experience. <laughs> in fact, I, I have a, I think there's going to be a verb in our house now. You, you've been kikied and, <laughs> um, I actually feel like that word um, Heather gave, and and it was for all of us. I, I I felt like it actually applied to Kiki, and God was showing me the 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 Mary in John twelve where she she just gave this extraordinary act of worship. This, this perfume that changed the atmosphere. And I just feel like her worship is going to change the atmosphere. And uh, I believe that's for her. And I'm glad she's here. She's changed our atmosphere and our home. And I believe she'll change the atmosphere in many homes. I want to thank those for those of you who are here for the, the first time and, and ask that you come back next year. And um, there's some stuff I wanted you to know about us. Um, we, we are held together by a few things. We're held together by uh, values, uh, like the grace of God. And I think the thing that we love about the grace, the main thing that we love about the grace of God is there seems to be so much of it. <laughs> and, um, you know, the angels and, and Peter it talks about how the angels, like they peer at the gospel and they don't get it. They're like, hey, we're, we're one and done. We mess up and it's, we're, we're goners. But these humans keep messing up over and over again. And he seems to love them. And this changes the atmosphere of our churches. We don't just want it to be a theology of grace, but an atmosphere of grace and the word and spirit, not, they're not enemies, they're friends. And, you know, our youth, uh, they just got so impacted by the spirit of God in, in the Midwest. I know all throughout our churches, but I could speak, I can give testimony to what happened in the Midwest. And, 
and uh, they, the, the Spirit of God created in them a hunger for the Word of God. And Bible studies broke out, and it's just beautiful to see that. And we're, we have a shared mission. We're partners in the gospel. We want to partner together to plant and strengthen churches. Relationship, a desire for family, not competition and rivalry, but, but genuinely being for one another. Uh, Paul said this to the church in Philippi, which is probably his favorite church. He may not admit that, but it seems that way. He says, is it, it is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affections of Christ. Um, no doubt on mission together, but family. And then we're held together by, by leadership. We take the Bible seriously when it says that we need each other and that every church has a gap and, and leadership helps to fill that gap. And, and we want to humbly come alongside churches and provide that leadership. And it's on behalf of the apostolic team, I just want to say it's such a privilege uh, to serve such a, an amazing family of churches, not just the Harringtons, but I'm glad that they all felt called to prophesy <laughs> this morning. Our theme this year is generation to generation. And, you, and the, it, for those who don't know, I mean, we planned this like way, long time ago. And uh, sometimes you feel been in, like, will it still be relevant? I feel really good about this one because it feels like, you know, it feels like we did it right. And, uh, and I'm really, we have great expectation what God's going to do in and through us. And this has been something true about us from the beginning. Sam already mentioned this, this culture uh, that was created uh, by John and Lin Linda Lamferman, uh, the vision that he put forth. Uh, for generation to generation, years and years ago, was like walking into a thick cloud. It was hard to miss. And, and being a young guy, walking into that, I, I just really started following Jesus. And I remember leading my very first um, small group. And, and it was the very first night. I was very well prepared, but it didn't go well. And I know it didn't go well because one of the members pulled me aside and said, this didn't go well. And... <laughs> And then he went on to explain all the different people in the church that would have done a better job. <laughs> you know, sometimes people say that um, the more specific the feedback, the better. I beg to differ. I don't, I would have preferred him not be specific. And I remember just thinking, like, I got into this thing because uh, you know, I was captivated by the church I saw in Acts. But I was experiencing the church I saw in the epistles. But in that moment, I just wanted something Old Testament to happen. And I mean, not, nothing too bad. Maybe just like a bad rash or something. I don't know. But my response to him um, has... I was reminded of my response to him. And I was taken back by, I, I, was, I know this is kind of a weird thing to say about yourself. I was taken back about my response back then. And um, uh, it'll, it'll relate to John here in a second. Um, I remember saying to him, they didn't ask me to, to lead this group because I'm the best leader, but because I'm the youngest leader. And, and it was, they're all about the next generation. And he made the vision so clear. It reminds me of another passage in Habakkuk. You know, write the vision down plain. Make it clear so that all that may see it can run after it. And he and Linda inspired a generation to run after this. And we're so, so grateful for it. Um, this emphasis put on our local church and our movement has put us on a healthy trajectory of responsible relevance. And uh, so grateful for it. it. Reminds me of in Michael Jordan when his career was one, sometimes we just kind of want to, you know, if people get past their prime, we just kind of want to see them move on. And I, I'm so grateful that uh, they haven't done that. Um, 
And Michael, as Michael Jordan's career was winding down with the Washington Wizards, you guys know Michael Jordan, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what you're doing here. And so we, uh, he, it, at the end of his career, he, he, was, he was still playing and, and a rookie decided to talk some trash. And he, this rookie said to Michael Jordan, you're, you're not the player he used to be. And Michael smiled and calmly looked down at and pointed at the guy's feet. He says, yeah, but you're wearing my shoes. <laughs> I don't want us to forget that we're wearing their shoes. In fact, I, I think it'd be appropriate. I mean, if you're over, I, since I'm almost, I'm over 40, I can't, it can't be those over 40. If you're over 50, would you just stand so we could just honor you here real quick? If you can, I know. I think there was more, but they couldn't make the trip, so. But this has continued. I remember six years ago when we were kind of reconstructing this whole thing, we now call it Confluence. We were meeting in a science lab, and it wasn't one of those cool high-tech science labs where something might spill and we become a superhero. It was, it was something that looked like, you know, something illegal happened in the 60s and they shut it down, or... And uh, if, if you think it sounds bad, it was worse. And so it was worse than that. And I remember we wrote on their whiteboard like, hey, what are the things that, who are we are that we, we, we want to maintain? What is it that we feel like we need to let go of? And what, is the th what are the things that we need to double down on? And I just remember, and uh, the th one of the, the key things that we wanted to double down on was the attention on the next generation. And it's something that lives deep, deep in us. And, and God's been doing something um, it, it, doing something more than just a few weeks ago, um, a few years back in, in Radiant, in, in Visalia, in the, in the camps out there, my, my, my daughter w had the privilege of going out there, and she just talked about being in, in meetings that lasted four or five hours long, and just the, the anointing and presence of God, and the, was, it just changed her. And in the last year, at, at our new day, like I've already mentioned, just God's presence fell on these kids in inexplicable ways. And they brought it back. And we had a prayer meeting the next week. And these kids were like leading in this prayer meeting and prophesying and leading one another to, to Jesus and baptizing and repenting of sin and, and getting into, into Bible studies. And, and God has been doing something. And then to see this thing break out at Asbury, is just amazing. There's nothing short than the presence of God. I think John Tyson said this, which I would totally agree. I had the privilege of going there. I mean, it was like a, on the surface, it was a bad Baptist service. It was, Elijah went with me, along with my kids. Elijah, our, you know, he's in charge of all, organizing all of our services. And we were both like saying like, man, like if this, if this, if, if our bands and, and the people who put on services, if this was what they produced on a Sunday morning, the feedback loop would be, would be harsh. It would be, <laughs> it wouldn't be good. Uh, we would be afraid that no one would come back the next week. Yeah. Oh yeah, except that God showed up and, <laughs> and like just changed our thinking entirely and waiting in line and all this bizarre stuff, it is driven by this presence of God and, and the Gen Z is just getting pummeled. I don't know if you guys have kids in middle school and high school, but they are getting pummeled. And uh, it's just so wonderful to see God's grace being poured out. And I'm anxious to see what he does in the days to come. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 Samuel 3. I, my experience at Asbury and caused me to 
if you care about this, I don't know, maybe you don't, change my sermon. And, um, and, I, and I wanted to look at this because of the context, and, and I'll, I'll explain that here in a minute. Nobody look at the clock. First Samuel 3. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. This is the atmosphere of God's people. God's voice was not heard very often. There wasn't a clear vision, people casting off restraint. This was a very discouraging time for the people of God. At that time, Eli, who, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, Eli couldn't see, was laying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark was. Then the Lord said to Samuel, and he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I didn't call you, lie down, go get out of here, take some Ambien, whatever you kids do these days, just get out of here. <laughs> and the Lord called again, Samuel, and Samuel rose and went, and Eli said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So this guy grew up in church, but he hadn't experienced God yet. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he rose, and he went to Eli. He says, here I am, and you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went down. Uh, Samuel went to lay down in his place. Um, he went back to his place. Just want me to say that, that revival can happen in your place. Um, revi- you didn't say Samuel went to Asbury. We're not storm chasers. We are those who are chased by the storm. As I was driving to, uh, you know, Asbury, I, I mean, I, I felt, you know, with my kids in the car, I felt like, you know, like uh, how, how those must have felt to get their friends to the pool of Bethesda and and it's just Jesus, of course, in that story, is like, you don't need the pool, you need me. So in verse 10, and the Lord came and stood calling at other times, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. I want to talk to you about generation to generation and fading light. Israel is at the precipice of a massive shift in their history through a new generation. But the context was fading light. The word of God was rare. Visions were rare. The priesthood was in shambles. And our text says that the lamp of God had not gone out yet, but it was close. Now, the lamp of God was never supposed to go out, and it was kind of a meaningless statement by the author, except that the lamp of God also represented Hope. So I think he's saying here, it's not just the light was going out, but hope was going out. His environment didn't expect much, but God was getting ready to do much. And Samuel represents a paradigm shift that would infect the entire trajectory of a nation. Samuel connects us to David. David connects us to Jesus. Jesus connects us to the Father who holds out the possibility of redemption to the whole World. What was about to happen was not business as usual. Something big around the corner, something that we wouldn't believe if God told us. Light is fading, hope is fading, Samuel's mentor is fading. I mean, his parenting strategies are the worst in the Bible. And I don't know if he'll be at the Heinz and the McCutcheon seminar, but his sight is fading. We learn later that his hearing is fading too. And we tend to think that the perfect environment plus the perfect mentor brings about the perfect plan of God. But it doesn't work that way. His power is perfected in weakness. He chooses the foolish to shame the wise. He uses fragile jars of clay to hold this message of the gospel. It's interesting, the epicenter of 
this revival is the Methodist? <laughs> I'm not wanting to pick on anyone, but, <laughs> you know, I read the stats, and their, the, the, their denomination is in free fall, and they're trying to hold on to orthodoxy, and they've got a lot of influential churches in their denomination going way progressive. Yet, it's this group that God decided to pour his spirit out. God does not need a celebrity Christian to make it happen. He doesn't need a personality or a gifting. He's looking for devotion. In fact, one of the ways that we can quench the spirit is to only do what we know we can control. You might say, well, I don't want to be out of control. That's chaos. So we seek to be in control. But life is not being in control or out of control, but under control of the spirit. So God in his mercy to keep us from being conceited gives us a fading environment. Like a flickering, you know, like when, a, when, a, when the wax is, you know, almost out, the oil's almost out, and then the light begins to flicker. That's kind of the environment that we see here. And if you haven't noticed, we are in a flickering environment. The stats in the church in the West, at least, are going in the wrong direction and have been for some time. Uh, the younger you get, the worse they get. We're losing about a million people a year in the church in the U.S. alone. And because the church is a salt of the earth, as the church goes, so goes the culture. We are stressed. We are depressed. We are confused. I saw this quote the other day by Bill. Is it okay that I quote Bill Johnson? Yeah. I've never done it before, and uh, I'm not sure how it's going to go. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you're like, man, this guy's going to revivals. He's quoting Bill Johnson. If he reads from the message, I'm out of here. So, like, I don't. <laughs> For those who are new, I've never done this before. <laughs> but come along with me. This is what he says. When you get rid of the creator, you get rid of design. When you get rid of design, you get rid of purpose. When you get rid of purpose, you get rid of accountability. When you get rid of accountability, you get rid of the need to answer for your choices. When you get rid of the of people giving account for their life, you remove the fear of God, and it's the fear of God that's the beginning of wisdom. When you have no fear of God, you have no wisdom, and all you're left with is total confusion. Welcome to 2023. That wasn't so bad, was it? I think, we can, I, think I can get behind that one. Um, psychologist Dr. Zambardo wrote a book, The Demise of Guys. Guys have been in trouble for a while. And I mean, there's a quote from Martin Luther King in the 60s. He says, we have guided missiles, but misguided men. That was good. Um, but he talks about how the average male growing up today buries himself in gaming and pornography. The average male, male, average male, by the time of 21, will spend 10,000 hours gaming. It takes half that time to get a bachelor's degree. That wasn't a joke, guys. You shouldn't. Don't laugh. It's not funny. Um, pornography. By the time I got to college, um, three different people had showed me pornography. I saw pornography three times by the time I got in college, which wasn't helpful. The average teenager can see more naked women in five minutes than their grandpa did in their entire life. It's the first generation of young people to be raised marinating their brain on pornography. I won't go a lot here, but it's entirely misogynistic, increasingly violent, fires off you know, your reward center of your brain, it doesn't know, it doesn't have any discernment. It just knows that it wants it. It connects violence um, 
with women, the average age of uh, a sexual offender, their first offense, the average age of a sexual offender's first offense is 14. 40% of children are born into father's homes. Father's homes and single greatest factor of drug abuse, alcoholism, incarceration, unwanted pregnancy, and future fathers, fatherlessness. There's hope, guys. Um, Timothy in the Bible could have been another statistic. He was just another uncircumcised son of an absentee father. But Paul stepped in and matured his faith, instilled with him confidence. He got a little timid at members' meetings, so he had to encourage him, but we all do. Timothy ended up co-authoring scripture and becoming a key pastor and apostolic delegate in Paul's ministry. So what can we do in fading light, generation to generation fading light? I wanna, I wanna suggest five um, movements, uh, tensions that I want us to dial in a direction, move the degrees in a direction. Not totally abandon, but move in a direction. First one is from human responsibility to di divine sovereignty. Capturing the, 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 the sovereignty of God in all things. It's what we heard in, even in the prophetic this morning. We all know where this story ends and we're pretty chill about it. It's dark, things are bad. Samuel will make it better. He will anoint David. Solomon will grow up, build a glorious temple, be the envy of nations. Another son of David will come along and build a greater temple and he will be the hope of nations. He will spur a gospel movement from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, even to the barbarians of North America. Yawn, when is lunch? We know the story. But knowing God is sovereign, knowing God has got this is really important. Yeah. Romans 8 very famously says, and we know for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, so he foreknew you. Then he set the stage of your life. To, and this is the point, to be conformed in the image of son, he'll use good things, bad things, whatever it takes. He knows just how to nudge you and move you. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And then it says those whom he predestined, he also called. So God foreknew Samuel and he established his destiny before he called him. He foreknew Samuel and established his destiny for calling is the moment. All calling is, this is all it is. It's the moment you become aware that the stage has already been set for you. You're like the actor who kind of stumbles onto the set and like, oh, what, you know, what's my line? And, and, and he tells you, the actor or the director tells you, you hire the actor, you don't hire the, you don't like, uh, hire the actor and then write the screenplay, right? You, you write the screenplay and then you bring the actor in. And, but you and I are in our individualistic, narcissistic, ambition-driven delusions dressed up in Christian cliches. We are not the beginning or the end of the story. What God is doing is bigger than when you became a leader. It's bigger than when you became a Christian. It's bigger than when your parents became a Christian. It's bigger... It's bigger than when the church got started. It's bigger than when the world got started. How long ago was that? Who knows? Before that. <laughs> we are talking about the eternal purposes of God. Yeah. And you talk to people who deconstruct, and they talk is like Christianity started in the 80s or 90s. <laughs> That's our fault. We're so steeped in individualism that we think that our experience is the experience. So we try to make God relevant to them versus telling them how their story is relevant to God. So we're trying to take the eternal purposes of God and wedge it into the, a 90-minute portion of their life. I want to show you how this fits into your life. 
Instead of saying, hey, I want to show you how you fit into God's life. It changes things. It changes how we experience things. The way we talk about God, you would have thought Jesus was raised in a four-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath house in the suburbs. So you hear things, oh, you know, Christianity, that's just white men in power. That's what, it, that's what it's all about, white men in power. Nothing, no, we, know, we, we speak nothing of the global church, speak nothing of the historic church. I mean, so people's minds are always blown when I say, you know, actually Christianity is the most, as far as religions or philosophies goes, if you want to put it in that terms, the most diverse system of belief in the world, and it's not even close. It's not even close. 600, 600 million in Africa are Christians, 400 million in Asia, 550 million in Europe, 600 million in Latin America, 230 in North America. On the other hand, secular humanism, born out of the 20th century, very white, very Western, very male, very educated, very wealthy. Secular humanists are 50% more likely to be male. 40 times, say 40 times, 40 times more likely to be white. So when we think about evangelicalism, or would I say that what most people, when they think about evangelicalism, they think about a white Western men forcing their beliefs down their throats. But the face of Christianity is not a white male. The face of Christianity, the most likely person to believe in the orthodox God of the Bible is a black woman. That is the face of Christianity. So we overemphasize our part versus God's part. Notice that God called Samuel not once, not twice, but three times. I get the impression that he might have went to 30 or 40 or whatever it took because that's the way God is. When it's your time to enter the scene, he does what he needs to do to move you in place. God is persistent. Jesus tells a story of a persistent widow saying that we should be persistent, but the whole Bible screams about a persistent God. I mean, I know the verses, you know, God is a rewarder of those who seek him. But your persistence toward God is not likened to, is not compared to his persistence of you. Standing in Asbury, drove five and a half hours, sitting in line, wonder oh, all these people, what, what they're doing to get to God. I felt like God just dropped this thought. You know how long I've been waiting to get to you? First, I got to wait, wait for you to wake up. <laughs> Revelation, God is standing at the door and he's knocking. It's your door and he's doing the knocking. It's not his door and you're doing the knocking. He is, you know what it looks like for you to see God? Oh wait, you're there, okay. That's what it looks like. The reason why we can be so confident that he is a rewarder of those who seek him is because he's here. He's everywhere. I mean, this is what David is talking about in the Psalms when he says, you know, if I, where can I go from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there too. If I rise up on wings of the dawn, if I settle far from the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. He is everywhere and he is pursuing and he is pursuing and he is pursuing and he will get you. So we move from human responsibility to divine sovereignty, independence to, de to dependence. We need help from others. We need help from others. You would think that Eli doesn't have any value, failed as a father, failed as a priest, sight failed, vision failed. According to Levitical law, he's meant to be semi-retired anyway. 
you know, move aside Eli, make room for Samuel. However, when you look at this story a second time, you realize that Eli does have value, but it, it looks different. It looks different. It's clear that Samuel has a gift, and it would have been tempting for Samuel uh, to go it alone. Um, but because Samuel clearly has the gift. He's the one who hears God. Samuel does, Samuel, uh, Eli doesn't hear God. Samuel hears God, but he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand. It's like, you know, like when you're like, I love older people in our lives can be like our iPhones. Follow me here. So when, <laughs> when you get a text, you know, when you get a text and like you, you, you see a number you don't recognize, you're like, I don't know what to do with this. I don't recognize this number. But Apple did a cool thing. They, they, the great AI in the sky scans all of your emails and everything and says, maybe it's this person. <laughs> That's what older people do. Hey, I know you don't know what this means, but maybe it's, maybe it's this. And they point us in the right direction. I'm 47. We point you in the right direction. What am I kidding? <laughs> just because you have the gift doesn't mean you don't know how to, just, just because you have the gift doesn't mean you know how to use it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not your fault. It just takes 10 years or so to get the wisdom of God, for the wisdom of God to catch up with the gift of God. That's why we need each other. I mean, he set it up that way. So it's not like we don't have to get stressed about it, feel bad about it. I was talking to a guy in our church the other day. He thinks he wants, he's like, oh, I think I'm ready to go alone. I'm like, dude, you don't even show up when it rains. Like, you're not. <laughs> you won't serve two weeks in a row because it affects your mental health. Like, you're, you're. <laughs> you want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. Here's the thing, if you get around older people though, here's the thing, it, it, goes fast. It, goes, it goes faster and further. It goes faster and further. So let me, let me speak in, in young person's terms. You will be more successful if you don't go it alone. You will be more successful if you don't go alone. You don't want to include others because you want to be successful. But I'm telling you, the Jewish community taught us that. Uh, the Jewish community in the United States is 2% of the population, yet Vanity Fair ranked the top 100 most powerful and influential people in the United States, 51 of them, 51 of the 100 are Jewish. They have the highest level of incomes, the highest level of education among all racial groups, disproportionate amount of Jews in politics, Hollywood, directors, actors, Broadway, majority of comedians are Jewish, probably because minorities are better positioned to assess what's really going on in the world. Comedians are seers. They see things. Musicians, if you see a white jazz musician, chances are he's Jewish. <laughs> a disproportionate amount of Jews lead Fortune 500 companies. Almost half of all Nobel Prize winners for science since 1901 are Jews. Deuteronomy 11, you shall teach them to your children talking to them when you are sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. They, they don't just teach parent to child. I did a series 15 years ago that I ripped off from Tim Chambers called What I Like About You. And when we, we talked about Judaism, and one of the things I learned is that 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 they don't just, when, when someone has a skill in the community, that, that parent teaches every kid in the community that skill. Wow. And, and so instead of a generation coming along and starting from scratch, they stand on each other's shoulders like that. It's what we read in the scriptures. Anyway, so Eli is weakened, but don't devalue him because the gift is gone. We need all kinds of people. We need, but I think especially daughters need mothers son, um, and fathers. We need each other. We need each other. Um, 
So they helped, they helped each other. And, and, and this is what we see. The, the, the younger generation helps us with innovation. What you and I call innovation, those of us who are older, the next generation calls the status quo. If you're in your 20s and 30s, innovation is easy to bring about change. It's instinctive. You, 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 you know what bothers you about the previous generation. You have an innate sense to know what needs to change. Uh, the problem with those of us who are older is that after time passes, the innovation that you, that you introduced quickly becomes the status quo, and you get viewed as the establishment. And for those who are younger, who are you know, nodding their heads, you're on the clock. <laughs> I remember everything. And I'm just kidding, I won't remember that. But it's harder to innovate as you get older. You, get, you fall prey to the sunk cost bias. I built this thing, I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta maintain it. Not so with the young generation. I mean, even now, like our apostolic team, there, there are four of us in our 40s. In our, he- in, our, in our heads, we're still the young guys. Um, but we're already talking about kids these days. I mean, we're already, it's already, I already, you know, like, we don't need an app to play in churches. Like, we, <laughs> we don't need Instagram. We have bulletins. That's how you do church. And like, <laughs> and so we, we realize, and, and actually Dylan has is, is come on to help us uh, with, with church playing. Like, man, we, we can't, we can't. Bulletin, I don't, I don't even know if bulletins are legal anymore. Can you, can you, can you print off that much paper? Is, are you allowed to do that? The older without the younger, we become irrelevant. The younger without the older, we repeat the mistakes of the past. But the generations are meant to overlap. They're meant to overlap. And I'm glad that they overlap in our movement. Independence to dependence. Um, thirdly, crowd to core. An emphasis on the crowd to an emphasis on the core. Can we move in these directions, please, as a movement? Samuel, one person changed the course of history. Of course, Jesus, we know, focused on the 12. He didn't focus on, he had the crowds. Nothing wrong with the crowds. The more, the merrier. But he did not focus on the crowds. He focused on the core. You know, we, sometimes we read Paul, and we'll say things like, Paul did this, and Paul did this, and Paul did this, and Paul did this. You know, if we were to ask Paul, he would not say, Paul did this, and Paul did that. He would say, we did this. We did this. He mentions over, he mentions exactly 93 individual people in his writings, partners in the gospel, men and women, partners in the gospel, pouring himself into others. Um, elders in the Bible are required to essentially do two things. There are two things to be an elder. Have a life worth emulating. Be an example, essentially. Have a life that's worth being an example. And then being able to teach. That is to take, you know, be able to teach truths that you can pass on and pass on and pass on and pass on. It's all about being able to take what we have and give it away to someone else. I got convicted by this big time last year. Um, if, you, if you're interested in knowing this kind of detail. So I'm, I'm preaching less this year. I'm doing less organizational leadership. And I want to spend more time with emergent leaders. Um, that's my plan. General Patton said this, Always have a man trained and ready to take over your job in case you are killed. The test of your ability is whether you could be killed and nothing would be lost. Here's Psalm 71. This is called Prayer of the Old Man. Oh God, from my youth you have taught me and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation. Your power to all. This was his prayer. Don't let me leave the earth until I have proclaimed this to the next generation. Pastor and author Tom Nelson from Dallas said this, it is my goal to have 20-year-old pallbearers at my funeral. 
young men with tears in their eyes, carrying my lifeless body, thanking God for the deposit I put in their soul. William Tennant, a pastor in the 1700s. Apparently, this guy was boring with a capital B. <laughs> they kept trying to remove him, but they couldn't because he was Presbyterian. Uh, <laughs> But he discipled five men and built a log cabin in the back of his yard to teach them. Shout out to Tom Shaw for having a cabin in the back of your, you're the only spiritual person here. Um, he discipled five men and they made fun of him. Williams Tenants Log Cabin College, they said. But those five men left that cabin. They left with zeal for Jesus Christ and spread it out across America to make the name of Jesus' grace. Oh, by the way, that log cabin became Princeton. Um, disciple John, 3 John 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. In other words, as I look back at my life, the best thing I've done on my way out is I took the truth of God's and imparted them to people younger than me. Focus on the core. Here's Paul, probably his second favorite church. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? for you are our glory and our joy. He's saying one of the things that I'm most excited about when Jesus returns is I will not be some solitary figure basking in my stories and stats. I will be surrounded by young people who I poured my life into and co-labored with me. I will be able to bring more glory to God because my ministry goes well beyond the grave. Paul says, I get to stand and celebrate with you, and that brings me so much joy. <clears throat> Crowd of core, priest to prophet. It moves from a, a priest to a prophet. Priests take the needs of God to people. Prophets take the word of God to people. Priests are really good at understanding people. Prophets are good at taking the truth of God. Can we move in the direction from priest? Not away, but I, I believe God is doing this. Priests have a, you see, Eli could hear Samuel. He couldn't hear God. Samuel could hear God. He couldn't understand God. He needed Eli's help. Prophets have a tendency to overlisten. Um, you know, Aaron is a priest, you know, he makes the golden calf. That's what the, you know, the, these, these people, they made me do it. Eli wouldn't speak the truth to his sons. I get it, man. This is not the side of the horse I fall off on. I, you know, I've never been accused of over listening. Um, <laughs> step, you know, my wife, honey, the problem is you just like listen way too much. <laughs> In fact, we even have a section now in our orientation for bringing on new staff. That's called How to Deal with Brian. And <laughs> I wish that was a joke. Um, it's like, here's your desk, here's your computer, here's your therapist. And it's like, well, you don't, I don't need a therapist. No, no trust me, you will. You will, you'll need it. But it's not just over listening to a person. Hear me, it's over listening to a culture. It's when we elevate what works, pragmatism. A leader, a leader wakes up asking one of three questions. How are people? What works? What's true? And if you over listen to the first two, it's, it's not that the, the other two are not needed, but there is an order to it. What's true? What works? How will this affect people? That's what we see in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12 says that we're all part of God's family. Every gift is needed, but yay, there is an order. First apostles, prophets, and on down. 
The role of the prophet is to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. No selective prophesying. I heard a pastor say once, we want people to get something out of our sermons, even if they don't believe in Jesus. The Bible says that what we speak to those who are perishing is a stench of death. It's why, it's, it's like Mo, it's why all these prophets were like, I don't know that I want to be your prophet. I don't, Moses was like, I mm, pick somebody else. Jeremiah's like, man, Jeremiah's like, man, every time I speak your word, they beat me up and throw me in a ditch. You know how many followers he had? Zero. That, that's not a joke either. He had no followers. Get him to speak at your conference. <laughs> Don't even bother putting his Instagram. He has no followers. Nothing he does works. It's just true. I, I know it doesn't look like I prepared, but I swear to you I did. <laughs> I'm just a bit disorientated. Can we stand? How about that? So can we get the that final slide up? Human responsibility to divine sovereignty, independence to dependence, crowd to core, priest to prophet. Oh. Um, that last slide was supposed to change. Uh, last picture. Um, well, this works too, what we see versus what God says. But I changed it last minute. It's not their fault, it's my fault. I believe God wants to move us from comfort to calling. I know he wants to move me up from comfort to calling. What I know, what I'm comfortable with, to what God is calling me to. I think he's calling us, I think he's saying to us as a group of churches, he wants to move you, move us from what is comfortable to our call. Man, you guys did that fast. Thank you so much. <laughs> We're going to tap into God's sovereignty because it's not going to look right. It's going to be nervous. We're going to have to try, have to depend on each other. We're going to have to focus on the, the core not the crowd, God's truth to people, not, not, not ignoring people, but not letting them be the rudder of our ship. Leave that responsibility to God. Jesus, I only do what the Father is saying. If anyone in the world could have been popular, it would have been Jesus. I mean, he had all the tricks. That, that was supposed to be funny, by the way. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Even his friends left him, though. Next generation. I wanted, I thought, I had this all in my mind that I was going to pray for, like, people under 40. But... I felt stirred not to define this morning anyway. There's, there's lots. This is just a frame. Guys are going to fill in the picture throughout the week. I felt not to pray, not to talk about next generation in terms of age, but in terms of opportunity. And I just feel like there are people who sense that they are on the edge of something that maybe they can't even quite define yet. It's not what you see, but it's what you sense God say. And it makes you uncomfortable. But he's calling you. He's making you aware 
of his predetermined plan. He's calling you. And, um, oh, great, the band's here already. Um, the, if, if, if you feel that, if you feel that, would you just come forward and receive from him? By the way, we, we hope this is a big element of our week together is receiving from God. We, we sense him. If God's pouring out his presence, we want to get buckets out and catch it. If you feel like you're on the verge of something, would you, would you come forward? The band is going to band is going to play and there'll there'll be people who will come pray for you but would you just would you just sit would you just stand excuse me before God would you spend some time standing before God let him speak to you let him reassure you